room. I'm so excited to introduce the next speaker. Ashwarya has worked as a data scientist across many industries, ranging from fintech to public sector, where she has performed data analysis to inform the UK's policy response to COVID. As someone who came to tech and data science from a non-traditional uh, non background, Ashwarya is passionate about making this field accessible to everyone. She has actively contributed to these efforts spe uh, through speaking at panel sessions, mentoring, and encouraging women to pursue careers in tech and data science. So please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Thanks for the intro. Um, nice to meet you guys. Um, so I'm Ashwarya, and I'm from Metal. So today I'll be talking about um, how we've used causal inference techniques um, to increase customer acquisitions here at Metal. Um, so a brief overview of what I'll be talking about. Um, so I'll quickly go through introduction um, to uh, what we do at Metal and also to myself. Um, and I'll be talking about uh, our current sort of onboarding journey um, and some challenges that we're kind of facing um, and how we've used causal ML and uplift modeling um, in order to kind of help solve that. And I'll go be covering some of like the theory as well uh, behind how all of this works. So, a uh, bit of an intro to Metal. Um, if you've not heard of us, uh, Metal um, provide free business bank accounts uh, for self-employed um, and small businesses. And our purpose is to give everyone the financial confidence to turn their passion into opportunity. Um, so we're owned by NatWest. Um, and I guess we, you can kind of consider us as Monzo, but for like business banking. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I've been a data scientist here at Metal for one year, um, and I work very closely with the ops and product teams um, on an analytics problems. Um, so as we previously said, I worked in consulting and public sector, and I started off um, in my data science career with a biochem background. So if you're interested in talking about uh, getting into data science from a non-traditional background, maybe talk to me afterwards. Always happy to help. Uh, but yeah, going on to the crux of the talk, so I'll be talking about um, Metal's current onboarding journey. So when a new customer uh, wants to essentially apply for a Metal account, what they do is download the app and they need to fill out details um, in the Metal application. So firstly, um, they need to provide details about themselves and details about uh, their company. Um, and this information is reviewed um, and um, approved if they're sort of an appropriate customer. However, there's sort of challenges within this current onboarding journey where there, there can be various points where customers can become disengaged um, and essentially don't go through the full journey um, and don't become um, approved customers. So the key challenge here is how do we re-engage these applicants uh, during the onboarding journey? So uh, we had a um, hypothesis that um, in order to re-engage these disengaged customers um, during onboarding, um, that if we call these customers, um, they'll be likely to essentially, uh, more likely to get approved. So we designed an A-B test, um, took a sample of uh, our disengaged customers, um, and we uh, put some of them in the control and treatment group. Uh, so customers uh, within the control group, um, we essentially uh, didn't call these disengaged applicants. Um, and we essentially measured how many of these uh, disengaged applicants um, organically sort of re-engaged um, and ended up becoming approved. Um, and within the treatment, uh, we called these applicants to kind of um, prompt them to finish their application um, in order to see how many of them um, ended up becoming approved overall. And we found that um, this pilot um, in increased um, the number of disengaged applicants becoming approved by 5%. So naturally, the recommendation would be that we would call all of these disengaged applicants um, um, to increase the number of appro approvals. Um, but is this the right approach? So this kind of goes on to the next part where I'll be talking about causal ML and sort of uplift modeling. So when we're conducting this A-B test, um, you're calculating sort of the average treatment effect. Um, so within sort of your control and treatment groups, um, depending on um, the outcome of the experiment, um, either the control wins or the treatment wins, and your entire population um, essentially either you, you call them or don't call them. Um, 
And uh, the problem with this is that um, calling all disengaged applicants is uh, very time consuming and expensive. And what we want to do is we want to understand if we can target applicants that are more likely to convert because there's no point contacting applicants um, that are going to organically convert anyways. Um, and also there's no point contacting applicants that are never going to convert. Um, so this is where uplift modeling kind of comes in. So uplift modeling is a causal ML technique uh, which is used for estimating the causal effects of a treatment um, at the individual or subgroup levels. Um, and it can measure sort of the conditional average treatment effect or the individual treatment effect. Um, and so in this example, uh, when we have a given customer and we, if we want to measure the likelihood of them becoming approved, um, we, uh, to calculate the conditional average treatment effect, what we do is take um, that specific customer uh, and look at them if uh, we call them what the likelihood of them getting approved is, and if we don't call them what the likelihood of them not getting approved is, and we essentially make the diff calculate the difference to calculate the conditional average treatment effect or the individual treatment effect. Um, and once we have like a metric uh, for that sort of calculation, we can uh, segment our customers um, into these four different sort of categories. So if a customer, um, gets approved if you call them um, or don't call them regardless. Um, these customers are considered as sure things. Um, so you don't really want to target them because you're kind of wasting your effort because they would have organically converted anyways. And if you have customers um, that will get approved, um, sorry, uh, that won't get approved if you call them or regardless if you don't call them, they're called lost causes. So either way, you've kind of lost them and there's no point sort of contacting these customers. And another category is sleeping dogs. Um, so these are customers which um, are, uh, won't get approved if you call them, but will do if you don't call them. Um, probably less applicable in this instance, but maybe if you've got like a subscription, um, subscription service um, and you might send, uh, send an email to a customer saying, hey, uh, uh, um, you've here's a discount for your subscription because you haven't used it in a while, then the customer might be likely to kind of um, remove their subscription. Uh, but the key, uh, key category we want to kind of focus on here are the persuadables. So these are customers who um, will get approved if we contact them, but won't get approved if we don't contact them. And in order to kind of optimize sort of our budget and target the customers who are the most likely to get approved. Uh, these are the key categories um, that we do want to focus on. So uh, moving on to our specific modeling approach. So um, the data that we fed into our uplift model um, were the results like of our A-B test. So uh, for each of the different applicants within our A-B test, uh, we have like different features um, about their application. So things that we kind of looked at is uh, information about their business, uh, so the type of the business, the risk level of the business, um, and also things like at what point, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> at what point in the onboarding journey they become disengaged and also um, how long it's been since they've been disengaged. Um, so features like this. And an another specific feature um, that we feed in is um, during the A-B test, if they received the treatment or they didn't receive the treatment. So in this instance, if we called them or we didn't call them. And also uh, we have the target variable as well, uh, which would be if the customer has been approved or not. So going on to the specific model um, as well. Um, so what we used is an S-learner model. Um, so we take the data that we have from um, the previous slide, um, the data from the A-B test, and uh, you train, um, train any sort of like supervised learning uh, classification model. Uh, in this instance, we used um, light GBM classifier, uh, but you can kind of investigate different kind of models, seeing what works best for your use case. Um, and after you've trained this model, um, there's two stages um, to when you're going on to uh, do the predictions. So, um, when you're, uh, when you're doing the predictions, you take all of your different X features and um, where you have the treatment variable column, 
um, you do different uh, predictions. So firstly, you treat all the customers as having um, received the treatment. So in this instance, having received the call to measure um, the prediction of the likelihood of them getting approved. And then you also take the prediction of if um, all these customers uh, didn't receive the call, what the likelihood of them getting approved would be. And um, you essentially take the difference to um, get the average treatment effect. So in terms of uh, what we have uh, for the model output, um, so this is kind of what it looks like. Um, so on a per sort of uh, user, ba uh, user level, um, you have the approval probability if you call these customers and the approval probability if you don't call these customers. And you have the ITE, which is the individual treatment effect. Um, so you, that's basically the difference between the two of them. Um, and based off of that, you can just segment your customers um, into the different categories. So for instance, um, the individual treatment effect for the user one would be 0.22, and they're on the persuadables. So fr from this, you can kind of uh, personalize um, exactly who you're going to target and make sure you're not targeting um, like the wrong um, applicants as well. And you can rank um, each of your applicants uh, based off of um, the individual treatment effect to see who you want to kind of target first as well. But that's, um, that's what I've been talking about. Let me know if there's any questions on any of this. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. How do you know if they're persuadable or not? Sure. So uh, when you have the output um, from the model, you calculate sort of the um, probability um, of how likely they are to get approved if you call them. And then you have another probability of how likely they are if you didn't call them. And you calculate the difference. Um, and in this instance, we set um, like manual thresholds um, in terms of what you think um, a persuadable customer would be, um, just based off of, um, so I guess. Comes from exactly, that's right. Yes. Uh, yeah, quick question about about the training data you are uh -huh. using. So you are only including the population in for the A/B tests uh, for the training data. Do you exactly. Also, do you also include um, like users who? Uh, like outside, so like users who converted before, like immediately before, um, before you do any contact, like before you run the A/B test. Do you think they are any useful to include? Um, I guess in this instance we haven't used them just because um, when you have the customers which are outside of the A/B test, um, you would have had some, um, I guess, organically kind of converting, um, and obviously like more data is always good, but you might have problems with like imbalanced data sets and things like that. Um, so in this instance, kind of just kept it with um, the like A-B test data. Because it's super interesting. Because <laughs> I wanted to try the same okay. thing. Cool. Um, uh, have you checked like from the, from the result of uh, the model, uh -huh. like are you getting consistent results? Because like when you develop the model, you can sort of get uh, an understanding of how good the model is, right? And then you can check that with the real data. Like is that... Uh, align with what you are expecting? Sure. Um, so I guess right now this model is kind of a work in progress. Uh, we're still kind of iterating on what we have so far. So right now uh, we've investigated it with the S learner model, uh, but there's different type of meta learner uplift models um, that I'm planning on kind of investigating. Um, so yeah. <laughs> So I take it you weren't in the MNS talk about this very subject. Right? Oh, no, I wasn't actually. <laughs> <laughs> they were talking about it. Okay, cool. Fair enough. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk. Just uh, uh, some questions around, let's say you actually, I guess two, two questions I have in mind. Mm -hmm. um, one is that like actually you have the persuadable segments and now you call them, they're actually not, not persuadable. How do you incorporate that feedback in the future? And I'm thinking like, 
second question is around like after you deploy the model, now you have don't have A/B test to mm -hmm. rely upon. Now you are like sort of whole thing is kind of biased, right? Like the model says call this person, you call this person. Then how do you keep on iterating this model? You have to deploy like A/B test here and there to like collect data again because I can imagine your business time might drift. Just depends on your marketing campaign or what kind of business turn up. So yeah, just a couple questions uh, in your mind. Okay, um, just so I understand correctly, um, you're asking once you've sort of deployed the model, you don't have the A-B test data. Um, how do you know that if you want to retrain the model? Um, yeah, what's the approach to that? That's an interesting question. Um, I think what you've kind of got to consider is um, maybe just take the data you have so far. Um, and see what the um, I don't know, it's a bit tricky. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit tricky because definitely, definitely. Your sample is definitely biased. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And it's like, a, like, yeah, you it's, you run as a host, like production issues, I guess. Like when you go and pro, like go after prototyping. Yeah, definitely. I guess you still have to call some like unpersuadable people to keep on exploring in a way mm -hmm. to try to find. But then that percentage and all that stuff. But this is like sort of ML ops and all the beauty of that. So <laughs> it's uh, yeah. Fun, fun is yet to come, I guess. Definitely. We'll get to that when we get to it. <laughs> Do we have any final questions? Yeah. I have one that is actually related to your background. You okay, said, cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, do, what do you think is the biggest challenge? Um, because you didn't come from the like sort of traditional data science background. I and think. Yeah. What what advice would you uh, have for people who come from a similar similar background as you? Definitely. I think the biggest challenge is like knowing where to get started because there's so much information out there, um, and it's a bit intimidating. Um, what I find it's useful is like maybe have a talk with someone who's already working as a data scientist, talk about like what you're like experienced in and figure out where the gaps in your knowledge are um, to kind of prioritize what you need to learn first um, and then just kind of go off of the back of that. Um, also, there's a tendency of people kind of maybe just uh, like doing courses again and again, but not really like applying them. The easiest way of like learning is applying it to a project. Um, and getting feedback, so I think that's like definitely like the best approach. Amazing! So thank you so much, and well done for your talk. Thank you.